Thank you, everyone, for joining us today uh, on behalf of CONMACIEL. This is our second 2018 webinar in our uh, yearly webinar series that our National Labor and Employment Practice Group hosts. Um, we have several additional future topics, um, so if you're interested in, in, in what we'll be doing over the course of the year, uh, please reach out on our website and you can register for the entire series um, or um, individual series. Also, as you notice, I have um, uh, the meeting is being recorded. So what we, we do is we keep an audio file of the recording on our website and I can circulate that to everybody after the presentation. The slides as well will be um, circulated um, to everybody after the meeting. This webinar has been certified for SHRM recertification credit. So at the end of the program, feel free to send me an email and let me know um, if you want the certificate and I'll shoot you over the certificate for, your, um, for the credit. During the presentation, please feel free to post some uh, questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we'll try and answer it during the presentation or at not, we'll leave some time at the end to be able to uh, talk to everybody and answer those questions. But it's my pleasure to start today's program on the NLRB update. I have with me my partner, Mark, uh, Mark Trapp. I am uh, the founding partner of our Labor and Employment Practice Group, and I do a myriad of employment issues, including union-related topics, including negotiating union contracts, providing anti-union uh, avoidance training, assisting with unfair labor practices, um, and union elections. I'll let Mark on the phone introduce himself. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, everybody. Um, I have uh, joined Con Maciel a couple months back. I'm in the Chicago office. I um, like being here. I, I worked with CARE for many years at a prior firm, and uh, I handle labor and employment issues of all types and varieties. I also deal uh, with employment litigation of all types and varieties, and particularly with um, multi-employer pension withdrawal liability. And if any of you know what that is, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> All right, with that, we'll jump right in to the topic of the day, and that's the National Labor Relations Board. It's a new day here in Washington. Um, you know, we thought we would get some relief from the Obama board um, pretty quickly after President Trump took office last year, but it really, unfortunately, has taken several months before we were able to get some of his nominees and nominated to the Senate Health Committee through hearings, through a floor vote, and now we are currently at a two to two majority of the board. As hopefully most of you know, the National Labor Relations Board, headquartered here in Washington, traditionally holds five seats. And the uh, current administration has the ability to, um, you know, a seat the majority of the board when those terms expire. And so um, up till this, up in December, we had Chairman Miskamara, Phil Miskamara, he was the chair. Um, and so at that point, we had a 3-2 majority, and his term expired in December. So we still have an open open term that we hope, in, hope will be filled very soon. But right now, we've got a current four-member board. And the current chair is Marvin Kaplan. He, his term expires in 2020. And he really comes to the agency with a strong administrative regulatory background. He previously had been with the OSHRC, the, the OSHA Review Commission. So he understands regulations, how rules get promulgated. He understands the adjudication of cases before the commission and comes, again, with a very strong background. So I think he's going to be a great pick for the chair. He's a friend of the firm. Um, we know him personally. He's very reasonable, um, very reasoned and intellectual, and I think he's going to make a, a great chair. The second Republican member of the board is Bill Emanuel. He comes from big law, uh, private practice. He'd previously been uh, working with Littler Mendelssohn. He'd also been with some other larger firms, Jones Day, I believe, as well. His term also expires uh, in 2020. The two Democrat members are Mark Pierce. You may recall Mark, he previously had been the chair during the Obama board, so he had been the chair for almost eight years. We expect him now to be the leading dissenter in most of the opinions coming forth. His term expires in August of 2018. 
Um, I, I, I have been hearing some grumblings from uh, various sources that he, would, he is going to try and get himself renominated to the board. Um, I don't know the likelihood of success on that. I think the business community is ready to have Mr. Pierce return to the private sector, um, but we'll see. Again, we've got this open seat um, that is, you know, is looking to be filled, and it looks like there might be some horse trading, as everyone in government and politics knows happens a lot here in Washington. So we'll see if, if, if Mark can get um, his, his nomination um, resubmitted or if we'll see a whole new um, person in that spot. And then we've got Lauren McFerrin, and her term expires December 2019. She's a relatively newer member of the board. She came on the board towards the tail end of the Obama administration. She came after the new rules had been um, implemented, and so as a result, she, um, I think, has a good working relationship as she seemed to have a very strong relationship with former Chairman Ms. Kamara. She seems to get along well with the board um, and is not as politically divisive as some of the other members of the board are. So we'll see. Um, but as I said, right now we're at a 2-2 um, position, um, looking to fill a fifth, a fifth person who has been nominated and we're just waiting on his appointment and hearing before the Senate Health Committee. So as I said, the, um, you know, Phil Miskamara, who his term expired in December of 2017, and, and he left with a bang. He left a lot of good um, Christmas gifts and New Year's Day presents for many employers right before he left. The board at that point was three to two, and as a result, they were able to issue several pro-employer rulings, which I'll talk about a little bit um, before turning it over to Mark. And although, Right now, we've got a split of two to do. We really think these decisions are going to be a good um, insight into where the board is going in the future, in the remainder of 2018, um, and certainly through 2019 and 2020. I think we start to see a lot of flip-flopping with the board when we see a change of administration, and that can cause a lot of confusion for employers. I think what would be great is if there's some sort of stability in federal labor policy, but as of right now, the board just like government and just like politics and just like, I think, the American people are very divided. And we're even starting to see that a little bit from the Hill. Um, we've got congressional members who are pushing back on Bill Emanuel's decision, his ability to participate in some of the decisions that I'll talk about, particularly the joint employer rule, because of his prior relationship with private practice. So unfortunately, that doesn't mean that the, the NLRB is free from, from partisanship, and we will start to see again what happens when the majority, the Republican majority, takes control with that fifth seat. The other major position within the, within the National Labor Relations Board is the general counsel. And the general counsel is Peter Robb. He was sworn in on November 17th for a four-year term. And he really, again, hit the ground running once he came into office. He, came, he also comes from private practice. He's a traditional management side labor lawyer from New England. Um, and on December 1st, he issued a guidance memo that revoked a handful of previous memos talking about a litany of employer issues and workplace rules that had been implemented by the Obama board including issues with regard to employee handbooks, um, and, in a, and notably one about settlement agreements. So if anyone is currently negotiating or working um, with, an, with the board on an unfair labor practice charge, and you are thinking of settling that charge, in the past the board has insisted upon certain default language in a settlement agreement. That that default language memo has been revoked by the new general counsel, and the regions now have it within their discretion as to whether including that default language in a settlement agreement. And so for those of you on the phone and on the webinar that maybe have that experience currently, I would strongly suggest you go back and look at that and, and give yourself a new argument that that default language does not need to be included in future settlement agreements. I successfully negotiated that recently with Region 5 here in Baltimore, and I, I anticipate the regions um, will be pushing that forward. Um, certainly that's coming right from the top from the general counsel. 
The other thing that the general counsel did in his December 1st memo was he required all the regional offices to, su to submit any potential complaints for unfair labor practices regarding certain topics to his office for approval before issuing the complaint. And this rule, this goes from handbook rules. You know, we all know the various issues in the past several years with handbooks and confidentiality and social media policies, things of that nature, including electronic communications and how you can use email and other electronic communications to, um, you know, to, to organize or for, for Section 7 protected rights. Off-duty access, that continues to be an issue for those of you that have you know, private and public property in front of maybe a, a retail store or a grocery store, how much access does an employee or a union get during off-duty time. Wine garden rights might be something that could be open to discussion as well. And certainly joint employer, which is something that came out um, in case law with Phil Miskimar in December, and we'll talk about that. So definitely there's a new approach to the NLRB from this administration. Um, as we're hearing, you know, from day one, this administration has been about regulatory rollback, um, making sure that if you're going to pass one regulation, two regulations on, on the books have to come off the books. Um, we're seeing that certainly with the budget. Um, the first budget that Pre President Trump proposed had a decrease across the administrative agencies. The NLRB was included. Even this year, again, we're, we're seeing a decrease of about 9% which is ultimately resulting in a substantial decrease in the number of full-time employees, whether that's through regular attrition, people deciding you know, they want to wanna do something else over the next few years. Um, in any event, there are about 170 open positions at the NLRB level throughout the regional offices that have not been filled. And while there's not a no hire you know, policy right now, we're not sure given that, that budget decrease whether there will be a funds to increase um, those open positions. So what that means ultimately is you've got investigators, you've got regional officers that are wearing multiple hats. For example, in Region 5, we've got you know, the regional attorney who's also the acting regional director. So he's wearing multiple hats at a time. You've got investigators that are out in the field that certainly don't have enough bandwidth to handle the various unfair labor practices and union election petitions that are happening. So that can be used to our advantage um, from the business community a little bit. Um, so it does show, again, the, their, their priorities and their mindset. Again, you know, re read the budget with a grain of salt. Um, he did, you know, it was drafted before there was this two-year appropriations deal. There is still talk uh, on the Hill in terms of future budget actions, but it gives a mindset as to what's happening with the board and the agency and the shrinking size of government, which will necessarily have an impact on enforcement, investigations, unfair labor practice processing, as well as election processing as well. And I think you really want to look at too, oh Mark, why don't you, why don't you touch about the, sort of the new approach to the board? Okay, thanks, Kara. Um, I, I concur with what Kara said about uh, what's going on on the on the Hill. And you can see, particularly with uh, new GC uh, Rob, who who has just recently come in last fall, this uh, th this approach in a conference call. He, the, Kara mentioned the the memo that he came out with in December, and we'll be coming back to that uh, more particularly uh, later in the program. But there's been some controversy around some comments that uh, General Counsel Rob made in a conference call on January 11th in which he outlined uh, some pretty significant changes that could be coming down the, down the pike for the NLRB. He was on a conference call with the regional directors. And uh, if you don't know, the, the board is, has uh, 26 different regional offices and they, they generally have a regional director that sits over, uh, oversees that office. And on a conference call with, with these regional directors, uh, Mr. Rob indicated that he was thinking about centralizing the decision-making process uh, for ULPs and perhaps reducing the authority of the regional directors. He did acknowledge about a week later that 
many of these changes would require notice and comment rulemaking, but again, it shows the mindset, uh, certainly of the general counsel, to uh, shake things up a little bit, maybe streamline, centralize. Um, I'd say overall, it would, it, it, it alarmed some of the regional directors and some of them even, even uh, released a letter after the call saying, oh, you know, we, we'd like to know more about what's going on. But really, I think it's more of just a, a, an approach to the, to the board that it is to show business that either, you know, we're on your side or at least that the, the era of, of what many saw as uh, overreach in, uh, by the Obama administration uh, board at the NLRB and sort of a micromanaging approach to employers and even to non-union workforces uh, you, you'll see as we cover some of the issues that, um, and many of you know, that the National Labor Relations Board during the Obama administration really got into non-union workforces to a pretty unprecedented degree. And I think this, is, this, this just shows sort of a different mindset at the board. If, uh, if the regional offices were consolidated and the decision-making uh, structure was, was more streamlined towards uh, decisions made in D.C., um, I guess it would depend which side you're on as to whether that's good. But for now, for employers, I think you could take some comfort in knowing that uh, unlike the, the prior administration, you have more of a, of a friendly faith in Washington, D.C. and the Labor Board right now. And Kara's going to talk a little bit about the uh, decisions that came out when there was that brief majority in December, and then we'll circle back on some issues that may be yet to come. Kara? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So the, the decisions I alluded to earlier um, were a handful, and, and I'll talk about them in depth, but we've got decisions on joint employer where the board overruled the expanded joint employer standard that was established in Browning-Ferris. We've got the employer handbook rules where the board reversed its prior standard evaluating neutral workplace rules in favor of a two-step process. We'll talk about that a little bit. The board issued a rule um, reinstating the traditional community of interest test away from the specialty, specialty health care standard, which allowed for the unions to be able to organize small departments or micro units within a larger employer work site. And then they also issued a decision reinstating a 50-year-old precedent on unilateral changes that had been upset by a 2016 decision. So on the joint employer decision, we've got high brand industrial contractors. Again, issued December 15, 2017. And here's where the board majority overruled a 2015 decision and reinstated the old standard that had been pla in place with respect to joint employers to begin with. So what had happened in, in Browning-Ferris, which was a real shift, tidewind shift, and that's up for appeal on the DC circuit right now, but they looked at a joint employer relationship, whether you are a janitorial contractor or a franchisor or a staffing agency, and they looked at that relationship and how much control did you exert over those contractors' workers? And under Browning-Ferris, the board had held, well, as long as there's indirect control or even the apparent or possibility of control through a contractual relationship, that could be enough to open it up to joint employer standard. And what Highbrand did is it reversed that, and it went back to the traditional standard where it says, look, in reality, two or more employees or entities are only going to be deemed joint employers if there's proof that one entity directly and immediately exercised control over the terms and conditions of the other entity's employees. And that makes sense. If you have a staffing agency and your supervisors are directing the work or disciplining the work of that, that staffing employees, you know, staffing agency's employees, that makes sense then that you as the, as the employer entity should have some control and direction and, and liability for that. But if you're simply retaining and having someone do work because you have some 
brand standards or other standards that aren't directly controlling and exerting control over those employees. The board is now saying that will not have um, a joint employer relationship. And so what it, what it did in that decision is it really clarified what proof is of indirect control or contractually reserved control that's never been exercised or control that is limited and routine, all of that type of conduct is not sufficient to establish a joint employer relationship. And I hope that gives a lot of people on the phone and on the webinar breathing room. I know it gives the franchise world a lot of breathing room um, because there's still a lot of decisions and cases that are pending with respect to that joint employer relationship. So huge impact on franchises, contractors, staffing agencies. There is a bill pending in Congress that would essentially codify this ruling and this decision. Um, so we'll see where that goes. That might help avoid some of this flip-flopping back and forth, because I know we don't want to see a reverse back to Browning-Ferris if the board majority changes in the future. But for now, um, give some relief to the fact that you're not going to be on the hook for an unfair labor practice if you've got these contractual relationships with vendors. The second big decision that they came out with was in Boeing Company uh, on December 14th. And what that did is it overruled a standard that had been placed limits on employer policies that might be, quote, reasonably construed to limit a worker's rights protected by the NLRA. I mean, the prior board was looking at all different types of handbook policies, as I mentioned, from social media, confidentiality, to see what you know, non-disparagement clauses, sort of code of conduct co clauses, to say, look, if you're scrutinizing or restricting someone from communicating on social media or in, or in a, an internal investigation, and that could impact their Section 7 rights, then that rule is overbroad, that policy is overbroad, and that's a prima facie case of an unfair labor practice. So now what the board is saying is, look, we're going to go back to a fact-specific scenario. We're going to look at each case specifically, the facts of each case, and we're going to apply really this two-step test. So if we've got a facially neutral policy, like a confidentiality policy or a social media policy, the board's going to look at two things. The first is, you know, the nature and extent of the potential impact on, on National Labor Relations Act rights, seven, seven, se Section 7 rights, you know, the right to engage in protected and concerted activity. If there's not real impact on those rights, the rule's not going to be found to be invalid. The second thing is the employer's legitimate justifications for the rule. You might have a no cell phone recording policy, for example. You can't record in the workplace, which the board has held in the past, and, the, and at least in the Second Circuit has upheld to be violative of Section 7 rights. But let's say that you are a factory shop, and you've got workers on a factory line who are putting widgets together. And it's a health and safety concern if you've got someone who's accessing their phone or making recordings on their phone or talking to people on their phone when they're also on a factory line. That could be you know, a legitimate justification for a rule of not having phones on the plant floor. And so here where you've got legitimate justifications which outweigh the potential impact on a protected right, the board is going to find that rule to be lawful and not, not break it down as an unfair labor practice test. So what you want to do now is you really want to have this balancing test in terms of how you implement and how you enforce your policies, particularly your confidentiality, social media, and non-disparagement provisions. I mean, I think it's still pretty clear that if you've got a social media policy and someone is using social media, whether it's their Twitter account or their Facebook account, for engaging in concerted activity to get people together, to band together, to collectively champion a change in wages, that's going to be protected by Section 7 rights. But if you've got that one-off employee that's using a Twitter rant to complain and you know, have expletives about his supervisor that's not tied to protected or concerted activity, I think it's certainly appropriate for there to be a you know, discipline based on a facially neutral social media policy or other code of conduct policy. 
So I know there was a lot of revisions to people's handbook policies, and I'm not saying go back and re-revise those policies, but it's certainly as you think about implementing and enforcing those policies, be sure to look at the Boeing case and understanding how the board would apply the two-factor test to determine whether the rule is, is uh, invalid. Then we've got the micro units test, and this overturned um, specialty health care, the 2011 decision in, in specialty health care. And what the, the majority did is it reinstated the traditional community of interest test that had existed for decades um, before um, the Obama board overruled it. And what specialty health care did is it allowed unions to a, a select the appropriate bargaining unit when attempting to organize an employer's employees. So think about a, a large retail store in you know, any major metropolitan city. You go into and you see the cosmetics department, for example. And then you go to the shoe department. And then you go upstairs to the men's department. Instead of organizing the entire store, the union has been able to organize you know, the, the five employees who work at the cosmetics department. And if they get their foot in the door with those five employees, it's much easier then to organize within and get to the shoe department or get to the men's department or get throughout the rest of the facility. So it was a, a huge shift in the way unions tried to organize particular um, industries, retail, particular healthcare as well. And what PCC did is said, no, wait a second. We're going to go back to the original test and we're going to look to see whether the employees in the petition for group share community of interest which are su sufficiently distinct from the interests of excluded employees in a separate unit. So go back to you know, a traditional thinking of how you cross-train your employees. And if you have a grocery store, for example, where you've got someone working at the, as a cashier one day, bagging another day, in the deli department another day, they all report to the same store manager, they all wear the same uniform, they've got the same handbook policies and procedures, I would make the argument that if strategically it would be advantageous to the, to the employer in a unionized organizing campaign to broaden the petition for unit to include those other departments because they share a community of interest. So going back to the original standard does allow employers to use that strategy as a tactic in response to a union organizing campaign and not allow unions to organize a micro unit. And then the last thing I want to talk about before I turn it back over to Mark to talk about where the board's going to be going is the fourth decision that the, the board made in, in December was on unilateral changes. This came out in Raytheon Network-Centric Systems. And it restored a 50-year-old precedent where unilateral actions of an employer will not constitute an unlawful change in terms and conditions of employment if it's similar in kind and degree with established past practice. So this situation often occurs with healthcare benefits, which may change over year to year, but you implement it um, with a rising healthcare costs or changes in your summary plan description. That's established. You do it. It's similar in kind and degree with, it, with past practice. So if you do that unilaterally without bargaining with the, with the union um, or over the change of such implementation, that's not going to be considered a unilateral action, um, even if um, they involve some degree of your discretion. So think that through too. If you are unionized right now and you've got you know, wage rates and you're you know, in the middle of subject bargaining, think through whether this new Raytheon decision gives you a little bit more freedom to implement some unilateral changes without requiring the union to come to the bargaining table. And with that, I'll turn it over back over to Mark to talk about kind of where the board's going to be going over the next few months and years. Okay, great. Thanks, Kara. Um, yeah, as, so as you can see from those decisions that, uh, that Kara mentioned there, all four of them had dates of issuance on either December 14th or December 15th of last year, and that was just the, uh, the day or two days before Chairman Miskimara's uh, term expired on December 16th. And so that brief 3-2 majority resulted in these four opinions, which I think you can tell are pretty substantial opinions. And so I, uh, we thought we'd take a look at this, what we called return to majority, because uh, without Chairman Miskimara there, it has dropped back to a two to two deadlock at the board. But that uh, deadlock is not long for this world. 
um, Trump has nominated uh, another uh, board member, John Ring, who practiced law with Chairman Miskimara. Uh, he was with Morgan Lewis, a management side firm. He's been there for a long time, 30 years, I believe, and is expected to be a pretty solid pro-management vote. Um, he was quoted during the o Obama administration calling the NLRB an activist board. Um, he did, before he went to Morgan Lewis, though, back in the 80s, he did work with uh, Wilma Liebman, who's a former Democratic member of, of the board. They worked together for the uh, Teamsters, believe it or not. And um, Liebman said that Ring wouldn't be an ideologue but he is expected to be a pretty solid vote for a uh, uh, Republican majority and a lot of decisions are on the, the chopping block, um, especially when you, when you combine it with the memo that, uh, that GC Rob has already put out showing sort of a, a wish list of, of uh, standards that he'd like to see returned to more of a traditional um, NLRB sense, and there's there's no the filibuster is no longer around. Uh, it is expected that Ring will be confirmed. There's a committee hearing that's set for March 1st, and it should not be much longer before he is he is confirmed, barring anything um, unusual occurring. Let's talk a little bit about you know Kara mentioned the employer handbooks and and policies under the the Boeing case. Well, we can already see some of the impact of that. Shortly after the Boeing decision was issued in December, the board um, asked the D.C. Circuit, before whom this Grill Concepts case was pending, to remand it back to the board so that they could reconsider uh, many of these rules under their new standard. They had, the, they had invalidated a lot of provisions in this Grill Concepts handbook that uh, th that did not comport with the uh, reasonably construe standard that prevailed under the Obama board. However, under the new test, under the Boeing decision, um, the board asked the circuit court to have a shot at reviewing the policies under that standard. And the DC circuit obliged, and so you see some pretty immediate impact there. Um, this, this, several of the rules, I went back and took a look at that case, and several of the rules that they asked to be remanded that they no longer sought enforcement of were the types of rules that Kara was mentioning, like uh, a team member relations positive culture rule, a team member conduct rule, online communications rule, a confidentiality rule. And so you can see sort of a, a return to, uh, to normalcy um, under this, this Boeing approach that, that we anticipate uh, um, will be rolled out even beyond this case. Um, certainly when you have a, a three to two um, board, you'll see much more, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see m many more pro-employer type decisions. Now, oops, sorry, I skipped one. Let's, um, I'm sorry, I skipped this slide. Um, the Obama board had, had invalidated many, many policies that were just sort of common sense policies that were things that were, where the, the employer would say you need to have harmonious relationships or um, you prohibit abusive or threatening language, things like that. And those types of things were invalidated by the Obama board. And I think under this Boeing test, you'll see kind of a return to common sense. And certainly, I think you can go forward uh, with a strong conviction that employers can, once again, you'll, you can lawfully require that, it, that employees maintain at least a reasonable degree of civility in the workplace. Um, I mentioned uh, the new general counsel, Rob Memo, and what you can expect. Certainly when, when uh, Ring is on the board and you have a 3-2 majority, this uh, memorandum by the general counsel provides sort of a roadmap for what you can expect. And I'll talk about some of those issues. One thing I'd like to pay uh, to, to, you, to notice right up front is the impact on 
non-union employers. Again, a lot of the overreach that a lot of people felt during the Obama administration from, from the board during that time was due to the reach into uh, non-union workforces and invalidating handbooks and policies and rules that were not even in a union environment. I think that will largely be coming to a, to a halt, and we'll see it, how, how that plays out. There's a few issues I'd like to discuss specifically. Um, some of these uh, issues were highlighted in the memorandum by GC Rob, and you can anticipate that uh, change is coming once the majority is, is reinstated. For example, here, here's a couple cases that this idea of protected concerted activity stems from Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act, which I'm sure uh, many, if not most of you, are familiar with. Section 7 protects an employee's right to engage in concerted activities for mutual aid and protection. Well, in, back in 2004, the board under President Bush had ruled that uh, these protections that didn't cover an employee who was seeking aid from coworkers when pursuing an individual sexual harassment complaint. In this uh, first case that's mentioned on the slide, Fresh and Easy Neighborhood Market, uh, the Obama board in 2014 overruled that decision. It was three to two. Chairman Miskimara dissented. And what was interesting about it was that the board found protected concerted activity and the way that they went about it. Normally concerted activity would be two or more employees that are acting jointly or a single employee who's acting with authority or on behalf of the other employees. Um, in this case, there was only one employee, and she had she had asked her supervisor to let her get in some training on an, some sort of alcohol program called TIPS, T-I-P-S. He asked her to leave a note in the board uh, on a whiteboard in the break room about it to remind him, and she went in there and wrote, uh, you know, I want training on TIPS, T-I-P-S. Well, somebody changed TIPS to T-I-T-S, and she came in and saw that and couldn't uh, take a picture. They didn't have, they didn't allow cameras there. So she copied down what was, what was there, and they had drawn a picture too, and, and she copied down what was on the board and took it to a few other employees to have them sign that that was what was on the board. Three of them signed it and said, yeah, that's what was on the board, and the employer took actions uh, um, against the employee that, that did this and then had, had told her to please not ask anybody else for statements that way. Well, a month later, she filed a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board and said that she was impeded in her Section 7 rights, uh, and the employer argued that it wasn't protected concerted activity because she was only one person and was the only one with a direct stake in the outcome. The board ruled otherwise and said that um, even though uh, th these, these other, just by have, asking these other employees to verify that that's what was on the board, that was concerted activity. Well, interestingly, the employees themselves, one of them said that filed a complaint against the, the, the woman and said that she felt bullied into signing the statement, and the other one said she felt intimidated. And uh, th all three of them said, that they didn't intend to do anything with their signing of the statement other than affirm that that's what was on the board. Nonetheless, the, the Obama board found that that was a concerted protected activity. And that sort of shows how uh, the Obama board approached things and how, how it's, going to be, it's likely to be different under the Trump board. This Pier 60 case uh, was another one sort of a, a – another overreach where in this case, this uh, employee had uh, posted this post on Facebook and, you know, Kara mentioned how a lot of these social media policies and Facebook's posts and everything were, were uh, scrutinized by the Obama board. This was one of those cases. Um, a, a manager came along. It was in the midst of a union organizing campaign, of, of course, at a non-union employer and saw a bunch of employees standing together and said, hey, you guys need to spread out, break up, get back to work. 
and one of the employees got on a Facebook account and posted, uh, Bob is such a nasty mother blank, don't know how to talk to people, blank his mother and his entire blanking family. What a loser, and ended the post with vote yes for the union. Well, the employer ended up uh, terminating the, the employee, and the NLRB reinstated that employee and said that uh, gave him full back pay and, and benefits with interest, um, saying that that was protected concerted ag activity. Now, it's pretty well established you can lose the protection of the act when you engage in vulgar and obscene or, you know, just inappropriate conduct, opprobrious conduct. Um, but the Obama board held that this sort of conduct was okay here. The new general counsel has singled that case out as one that he wants to take a look at. Another one that he singled out is this Cooper Tire and Rubber. This was some racist comments which were approved by the prior board. In the midst of a lockout, the company had locked out its uh, employees in the midst of a labor dispute. Um, the company hired some replacements who were crossing the picket line in a van. Most of the replacements were African American, and one of the strikers uh, approached the van and, and said, uh, you know, something along the lines of, hey, do you, you know, did you guys bring enough Kentucky Fried Chicken for everybody? And th does everybody smell that? smells like fried chicken and, and watermelon and you know, made these sort of ra racist comments. And when the employer settled its, its labor dispute and brought the employees back to work, it terminated this, this guy for his comments um, in accordance with its policies under uh, EEO and Title VII laws and, and to prohibit racial harassment. He challenged it, and the board upheld his, his comments and said, well, there really wasn't a direct threat. It's not clear whether the, the um, gentleman in the van heard the comments or not, and so uh, the, the discharge was illegal. And that actually went to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, which upheld it two to one over a strong dissent. But it, it just shows, you know, the courts of appeal defer to a lot of these rulings, these administrative rulings, and this is the sorts of rulings that you end up with. I mentioned again this Pier 60 uh, social media postings. I've already discovered, discussed that, so I won't go over that anymore. And I'll turn it um, back over to Kara to discuss this other case that, that came down during the Obama administration, uh, Purple Communications. So yeah, so Purple Communications dealt with the ability of employees to be able to use employer-provided electronic systems for organizing activity or for Section 7 rights. So if you, as a company, provide an email account to your employees, and you may have a, you know, a computer use policy that says you can only use your, your work-related email account for work-related businesses, the board said that, nope, you should be allowed to use it. It's the common day bulletin board, and you should be able to allow employees to use their emails for union-related activity. And so no longer are you able to discipline somebody for taking up, you know, sending mass mailings to employees about, you know, an organizing campaign or things of that nature. So that's another area that we expect the um, – the board to look at closely and potentially overturn in the future. Mark, you want to talk about Wine Garden? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do. This is kind of a big one, and this, this is one that many of you are, are, I'm sure, are familiar with, and that in general has flip flopped back and forth, as as Kara mentioned, a lot of these policies do. This is one that has a long and uh, uh, zigzaggy history through the National Labor Relations Board. These Weingarten rights, Weingarten stems from a case that was decided by the Supreme Court back in 1975. So this is, you know, Gerald Ford era. And it basically held um, that an employee has the uh, right to be represented by a, a union upon request uh, at any investigatory meeting where he or she has reasonable grounds to believe that the meeting could result in disciplinary action. And that right has gone back and forth through various administrations. I think it, you know, 
in, in the Reagan administration, they said it did not apply to non-union employees. In the uh, Clinton administration, it, it flopped back the other way. And then in the uh, second Bush administration, it went back the other way. But amazingly enough, in the Obama administration, the, it was never uh, it never flopped back the other way to uh, say that non-union employees had these wine garden rights. However, it was expanded in many other ways that, that had not been done previously, and that's the discussion of, uh, of this slide, several of these cases that are on GC Rob's uh, radar now. One is this Fry's Food Stores, and here the, the employer was investigating a theft, and the employee figured that, that um, she might be in a, a target of, of an investigatory meeting and spoke with her union rep and set up that the union rep would be in the area the next day. Well, sure enough, she got called into the HR office and wanted to call the union rep. And the employer said, no, you can get the union rep that's here and went and grabbed the, the floor steward that was, that was on duty at that time. Brought the floor steward into the meeting and um, the floor steward didn't know much of what was going on, but was in the meeting, didn't ask any questions, but was never told that, that, that she couldn't. And the, uh, the result here was a ULP alleging that uh, the employee's Weingarten rights were curtailed. Uh, the board upheld that and said that um, the employee had the, had the right to a pre-interview con conference with her chosen union representative and that she should have been given the right to call this other shop steward and, and, uh, and come in. And that that... Uh, that the employer um, erred or acted inappropriately when it when it told the union steward that came in that her role was to observe and listen. Um, that was a, a an expansion of these Weingarten rights. Uh, similarly, in the Towards case, a this one's even more remarkable. The union steward had wrote down some answers for the for the employee in, in his notebook. And when the employee was talking to the uh, employer, to the, to the managers in an investigatory meeting, the union rep starts tapping on the notebook to get the guy's attention and then angles the notebook so that he can read off of it. And he starts reading this statement. The employer said, hey, put the notebook down. You can't do that. And he'd finally get the guy to put the notebook down and um, the board under President o o o Obama era said that uh, that denied the Weingarten rights. And Ms. Gamara wrote a dissent and said, no, this guy was providing a script. And even under the Supreme Court's opinion in Weingarten, the, the, the employer is entitled to hear just what the, employee, what the employee, what their version of events are, not to have the scripted uh, account. Well, the board saw it otherwise, and that's the – current law out there, uh, but again, it's on Rob's radar and uh, likely candidate for reversal at some point if it becomes uh, before the board. This Manhattan beer distributors also expanded Weingarten rights in the drug testing context. Um, that's another one to keep your eye out for. I wanted to talk a little bit about successorship. This is another important area, um, particularly for employ employers that may be acquiring other businesses. Here, uh, as you know, in, in um, successorship type situations, you have um, whether or not an asset purchaser has a duty to bargain with, a, with the incumbent union of a uh, place that they're taking over depends on whether the majority of the buyer's workforce consists of former employees of, of the seller. This was decided in a case long ago called Burns before the Supreme Court. I think it was in the 1970s, 1972 or so. Um, so it generally turns on the on the workforce and whether a majority is former employees of the of the seller. Well, in in this case, um, GVS Properties, I think it was in New York and uh, at a hotel in New York had a statute that said you had to keep these employees around for 90 days after you took over. So the employer didn't have a choice as to whether or not to hire these employees or not. Um, so then it argued that it shouldn't be bound to the successorship until it was able to exercise its, not, it, its right to either hire or not hire these employees. 
um, because it had to keep the employees for the first 90 days. The board disagreed and said that it was a uh, Burns successor and had to recognize and bargain with the union, even though it had no choice in whether to hire these employees or not for the first 90 days. All the employer was saying was make that decision after we've been able to exercise our own voluntary choice. The dissent, uh, again, argued that the employer had to make a conscious decision here as to whether, you know, have some sort of a choice. That was um, not uh, the way that the majority saw it, and that is the law in less than until changed. There's also this idea of a perfectly clear successorship. Now, the difference between this and just a normal successorship. If you're a successor, that is generally it turns on the majority of the employees again, but if you're a successor, you can't implement your own terms and conditions. You just have a duty to, to, to bargain. But if you're a, quote, perfectly clear successor, you have to consult with the union as to the initial terms and conditions. That is basically you're taking the existing status quo, the contract there, and bargaining from there, and it makes a big difference. The The... Uh, board and courts have held for, for many years that you would be a perfectly clear successor where you didn't communicate to the employees before you took over that there were going to be new terms and conditions of employment. Well, in the cases on, on this slide, it was expanded uh, beyond even that by the Obama era board. For example, in this creative vision resources, um, the, and, and what I put on here, this where employer had effectively communicated its intent to set new terms, that was how G.C. Robb characterized it in, in his memo. So that's encouraging because here's what happened. The, the employer had um, taken over this new workforce and had given people applications and only told some of them that there would be different employment terms. But uh, when people showed up uh, to – to work the, that first morning, they had a, had a meeting and said, hey, here's the terms and conditions. You can take them or not. This is up to you guys whether you want to work under these conditions. And some did, you know, most did, some did not. Well, the board held that, that they were a perfectly clear successor despite the fact that they had told the employees that they, uh, that they were going to work under new terms and conditions because it was just that, that morning. Um, same thing in this Nexio Solutions case, uh, they held that the board held that they were a perfectly clear successor and therefore had to adopt the existing uh, terms and conditions, not because of what the buyer uh, communicated to the, to the em employers, but because of what the seller initially promised the employees. The seller promised the employees that they would be hired by the buyer under basically the same terms and conditions of employment. The buyer, the purchaser of the business, never said that to the employees. And yet the, uh, the board ruled that they were a perfectly clear successor and bound by this representation of the seller. Um, that didn't sit well with uh, the purchaser, but they lost. Um, luckily for uh, us going forward, it didn't sit well with the new general counsel, Rob, and it's on his radar, uh, hopefully, to be overturned. Nonetheless, you need to remain vigilant because it is the – law of the land until changed uh, by the board, and you don't want to be the, the test case necessarily either, but hopefully that will be changed with some dispatch. Um, finally, I'll talk about these, uh, what I call the other union priorities. These are a few other items that unions got um, during the prior administration that uh, will likely be on the chopping block uh, in the new administration. This dues checkoff obligation, this was the law for a long time that a dues checkoff obligation did not survive the expiration of the collective bargaining agreement. It gave employers some leverage to, to use. Well, that went out the window with this Lincoln Lutheran case uh, when the board ruled that it did survive the expiration of the collective bargaining agreement. And again, that had been, the, the, the reverse had been the law for many decades and that was uh, thrown aside. The, this Piedmont Gardens was the same way. The unions wanted witness statements uh, from, from investigations undertaken by the employer. In Piedmont Gardens, the board ruled that they could get those. Both of these cases are on the chopping block. And again, um, this witness statements issue in particular deals with uh, not, even the non-union workforces. And so you see, again, this return to normalcy that, I, that I've talked about is more 
it's not a, a, a new and radical approach of, of the expected majority under the President Trump's board, but more of a uh, restoration of standards that existed uh, for some time. So you're not seeing a, a radical approach uh, here. It's just more of like striking down the overreach of the, of the prior administration. And one area where that's a, a big issue is the, this election rules that were changed in the Obama um, board. And I'll let Kara address that. Okay, so the, the last slide before we open it up for questions are the speedy election rules, or otherwise known as ambush election rules. And what the board is asking is they sent out a request for information seeking input regarding the 2015 changes to the union election procedures. And what the RFI says is they want to decide whether to retain the rules without change, retain with changes, or rescind them ent entirely and make changes to the uh, prior election rule. I don't think they're going to do option one, retain the rules without change, and I don't think they're going to rescind them. So now we're really looking back at retaining them with modifications. And the question is, what modifications need to be made in order to achieve a little bit more reasonable parity with respect to the election rules? Comments were initially due in February. That has been extended to March 19, 2018. There is a push by a number of trade associations to extend that even further. Some people would like that, that deadline extended beyond August of 2018 when hopefully um, Mark Pierce is no longer a member of the board. We'll see. For now, they are due March 19th. And if you're interested, we are preparing comments on behalf of a trade association. If you or you, you know an employer group would like to submit comments, get in touch with Mark and I. Um, it's a real opportunity for the business community to be able to explain how these rules have impacted you. If you've had a union organizing campaign in the last few years since these rules came into effect, Ideally, looking at these statistics, we don't see the median time between a petition and election to have um, changed. They did go down 23 days, which the average was 45, but that hasn't ultimately changed the union percentage. Um, it's still hovering around 68.8%. So that's sort of where we are now. Again, be in touch if you're interested in submitting comments or want to learn more about those rules. But in the meantime, to keep in touch with this and other ever-changing issues in employment law, please check out our blog, Employer Defense Report. We update it weekly. And now we'll open up to questions. If anybody has questions and want to type something in the Q&A box, please do so. And Mark and I are here to answer them. In the meantime, thanks, everyone, for participating. As I said, the slides will be circulated to everybody on the call. And there will be an audio recording if someone in your organization missed the webinar today and you want to share it. And we hope that you enjoyed the program. Please give us feedback on the survey um, on how we can do better or what you liked or what you want to see in the future. And we hope you come back um, for a future webinar series later in the year. Thank you.